بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وصحابته المنتجبين قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وإلى مدين أخاهم شعيب قال يا قوم اعبدوا الله ما لكم من إله غيره صلوا على محمد وآل محمد محمد وآل one of the great prophets that is mentioned in the Quran is Prophet Shu'ayb alayhi salam. The biblical term for Shu'ayb is Jethro. And I will explain the difference between the, the way the Bible um, explains his story and the way the Quran explains his story. Shu'ayb he is mentioned 11 times in the Quran and his story follows the story of Hud and Salih and Lut. And historians say that he is from the descendants of Prophet Lut. So the event that we described yesterday, the story of Prophet Lut, it was close in time and in place and in location to where Prophet Shu'ayb is. So he was sent to the people of Madian, the Madinite, and that is in the northwest of the Arabian Peninsula on the east shore of the Gulf of Aqaba on the Red Sea. So basically between Jordan and Saudi Arabia today, somewhere in that location, that's where Prophet Shu'ayb was, and that's where Madian is, and it's also close to Egypt. So it's in between these countries, in that area. And the people that he was sent to, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes them as Ashab al the people of the tree. Just like Thamud and Ad, there is a group of people that lived in those areas. Iram was the, was the location, and the people are Ad and Thamud, they lived there. Then here, um, Madian is the city and the prophet is Shu'ayb and the people are Ashab al aika the people of the tree. And the reason they are called Ashab al aika was because they began to worship a tree, a specific type of tree. They began to worship it amongst the other idols that they are worshipping. So they were not only idol worshippers, but they would also worship the specific tree, the aika. And they had many other bad habits that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes in the Qur'an. Prophet Shu'ayb is also one of the Arab prophets. The Arab prophets that are described in the Qur'an, according out of the many prophets that are mentioned in the Qur'an, there are only a few Arab prophets. One is Hud, Salih, Ismail, Shu'ayb, and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa These are the Arab prophets that are mentioned in the Qur'an. Other than them, they are all from Bani Israel, from the Israelite prophets. Or Prophet Nuh who comes even before them and the prophets and Adam and the ones before. Prophet Shu'ayb alayhi salam, he is known amongst the prophets and this is taken from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa as Al-Wa'ad Al-Balighe Bain Al-Anbiya. He was an orator. He was an eloquent speaker from amongst the prophets. And this is what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa described him as. And the story of Jethro or Shu'ayb is also mentioned in the Old Testament, in the Bible. Jethro in Arabic is Yathrun. And this story is also mentioned in the Bible. However, there is a difference, and this is what has brought some scholars, Muslim scholars, to think that there may be two, two Shu'aibs. 
there may be two or it may be completely two different individuals, two different personalities. Because Jethro, Yathrun, is described in the, in the Bible as the father-in-law of Prophet Musa alayhi salam. He is described as the father-in-law of Prophet Musa. And this is what is known also amongst Muslims. However, the story of Prophet Shu'aib in the Quran does not mention anything that has to do with Prophet Musa alayhi salam. If we look at the Quran where Shu'aib is mentioned, Shu'aib is mentioned as he was sent to a group of people, the people of Madian, and he, they, would, they would cheat people and they would have fraud when, in their financial transactions and the adab of Allah came upon them. And the story of Shu'aib in the Quran is very close to the story of Hud and Salih. And Prophet Musa alayhi salam, he came many decades after, many years after. So this has led some to think that the story of Jethro in the Bible, Yathrun in the Bible, is different from Shu'aib, the story of Shu'aib in the Quran. And yes, Allah describes the, the, that Prophet Musa alayhi salam, when he, left, when he left Egypt, he came to Madian, and he saw two women, and they said, our father is an old man. The Quran does not mention what the name of the father is. So this has led some to assume and think that that father, the father that is described in the Quran, the, the father-in-law of Prophet Musa salam, is a different man. For some, some scholars, they say that this one is the nephew of Prophet Shu'aib. The father-in-law of Musa is the nephew of Shu'aib that is mentioned in the Quran and his name is Ra'awil. And others, they have different opinions, but even though the popular opinion amongst the Muslim Mufassireen is that Shu'aib is the same Shu'aib as the father-in-law of Prophet Musa And Prophet Shu'aib lived a very long life. He also, according to tradition, he lived over 200 years. So there's nothing wrong with him being described in the Quran in one story, sent, sent, being sent to the people of the Aika who were punished, and then he lived and then Prophet Musa married one of his daughters. There's nothing wrong with accepting that. Although some, they say it might not be Shu'aib who was the father-in-law of Prophet Musa Now, the story of Prophet Shu'aib is mentioned in several uh, chapters in the Quran. In Surah Al-A'raf, Surah Hud, Surah Shu'ara, and Surah Al-Ankabut. So this is one of the prophets of Allah that his story is mentioned in several uh, chapters in the Quran. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins the story by stating, وَإِلَىٰ مَدْيَنَ أَخَاهُمْ شعيب. And to the people of Madian, أَخَاهُمْ شعيب. Also, he came to them as a brother. Just like Allah describes with Prophet Salih, with Prophet Hud, with all of the other prophets, meaning he came to them as one of them. Not someone who's above them, not someone who's looking down upon them. And he comes to them with brotherly advice. وَإِلَىٰ مَدْيَنَ أَخَاهُمْ شُعَيْبٍ قَالَ يَا قَوْمِ عَبُدُ اللَّهِ مَا لَكُمْ مِنْ إِلَٰهٍ غَيْرُهِ Oh my people, worship Allah. There's no one other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Believe in Allah, worship Allah. He invited them to believe in Allah. And this was the message of all of the prophets of Allah. Every single prophet that came, starting with the first prophet until Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa they all invited people to believe in Allah, to worship Allah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he goes and he stands on the mountain of Safa, and he tells people, قُولُوا لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ تُفْلِحُوا Say, لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ and you will succeed. And this was the message of all of the prophets. All of the prophets, they came with the same message, in a brotherly way, in a friendly way, calling people and inviting people to believe in Allah. And this is a lesson for us. If I want, to, if I want people to learn about Islam, if I want people to follow Islam, why do, I, why do I not follow the ways of the Prophet? Through a very friendly way, through a very compassionate way, the way of Rasulullah and the way of the Prophets. Allah says in the Quran, اِدْعُوا إِلَىٰ سَبِيلِ رَبِّكَ بِالْحِكْمَةِ وَالْمَوْعِظَةِ الْحَسَنَةِ Invite people 
for the sake of your Lord with what? Should I come and yell at people? Why are you not Muslim? Or what ISIS is doing and Taliban and the terrorists going and killing people who are Muslim and non-Muslim? No. Allah says, Id'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah with wisdom. Wal mawadat al hasana and the good admonishments. So this was one of the wrongs that they had. First of all, they were idol worshippers. And second, every community that Allah describes in the Quran, they had one specific quality, one specific trait that led the adab of Allah to fall upon them. There are many idol worshippers. There are many pagans all over the world. Why were all of them not punished? And only these ones that are mentioned in the Quran, it's because they brought the punishment onto themselves. It's because they did certain things that even if the punishment of Allah does not fall upon them, they make their society a horrible society. And in reality, they, may, they bring the punishment upon themselves. So the people of Prophet Shu'aib, they had a habit and they had certain habits that led to the wrath of Allah coming upon them. What was their habit? Their habit was economic cheating. Cheating people, fooling other people, financial cheating, financial fraud. You know, we talk about Wall Street. Well, there were people that came before them. The people of Prophet Shu'aib, they were known to cheat people. They were known to, if they put something on the scale, on the mizan, they would, they would cheat in a way where theirs would be heavier, where they would make theirs way more. Now someone comes and says, what does Islam have to do with this? Islam, Allah tells us to pray, to worship, to fast. What does this have to do with the way I make my money? But the religion of Islam is a way of life. Islam is not just one day a week. I go to the church, I go to the masjid, and that's it. I go and I leave my religion at the masjid and then I go home. My transactions, my relationship are all haram. And then I go one day to the masjid, to the church, to the synagogue or temple. That's not Islam. Islam is a way of life. And it has to do with every component of our life. This is why we described yesterday. The people of Prophet Lut were punished. Now someone could say, what does what they're doing? They're doing something on their own. And what does that have to do with religion? What does that have to do with with their relationship with Allah. Well, Islam is a way of life. It's not just praying and fasting. Yes, praying and fasting is one part of the religion of Islam. But Islam, it covers everything. It teaches us how to live our lives. And this is why the religion of Islam is the fastest growing religion. This is why the religion of Islam, it's growing fast and it has the, one of the highest influ it influences people. Because everything that we do in our life, it's influenced by Islam. And this also leads to the growth of the religion of Islam. So, Prophet Shu'aib, he comes to his people and he tells them, وَلَا تَنْقُصُ الْمِكْيَالَ وَالْمِيزَانِ Do not cheat people in the mizan, in the scale. And when you are weighing things, because people at that time when they make a transaction, they weigh it. They see how much it weighs and then they make a trade based on how much it weighs. And then he tells them, إِنِّي أَرَاكُمْ بِخَيْرٍ وَإِنِّي أَخَافُ عَلَيْكُمْ عَذَابَ يَوْمٍ مُحِيطٍ He says, you are living well. You're fine right now. Why do you need to cheat? Why do you always need to make that extra dollar? Why do you need to make that extra haram money? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guaranteed your rizq. Allah has guaranteed your sustenance. Why do you need to go and go out of your way and cheat people and do something wrong to make a little bit more cash? And this is what people do. This is what people do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guaranteed our livelihood. If we work, if we strive, if we struggle, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guaranteed our rizq. Just like Allah gave us our rizq when no one knew about us. At a time when you were in the womb of your mother, who was sending you the nourishment? Who was sending you the rizq? It was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No one knew about you at that time. Do you think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to leave you now? No. If you strive, if you struggle, Allah will give you. But the problem is, people want to cheat. People always want to get something that doesn't belong to them. And they make it haram upon themselves. And... 
they take away the share of other people. They take away what belongs to other people. So he tells them, Inni arakum bikhair. You are fine. You are fine with what you have. You don't need to go and cheat other people to make a little bit of more cash. And I am afraid that you will be punished. Just like people before you were punished by Allah, you can also be punished if you continue carrying out these bad habits. Oh people, do not cheat the scale. When you are making a transaction, don't cheat people. Now, historians say that where Madian was situated on the map, they were between Hejaz, between Arabia, and between Sham and the Roman Empire. So people, they have to pass by that area. They have to pass by that area, and whoever passes by their town, sometimes when people are traveling, they run out of cash, they need to trade, they need to buy food. So they have, they have items, they trade them to buy certain things. Now, these people, they were in the path, in the trade route. So people are coming by and they need to make a transaction. They need to buy food or something. They need to buy something from them. So they would come and they would cheat people when they buy from them. And you know, we all know how it is when you're traveling and you have a, a, you're in a city or a group of people try to cheat you when you're traveling. It's happened to us. Sometimes we're traveling and that's the time that you're desperate. That's the time that you are in need of honesty. You find a group of people that will cheat you. And this is what they would do. So they were in a trade route where they're constantly cheating and fooling people when it comes to transactions. So he tells them, وَلَا تَبْخَسُ النَّاسَ أَشْيَاءَهُمْ وَلَا تَعْثَوْ فِي الْأَرْضِ مُفْسِدِينَ When people come and offer something to you, what they would do is, what, what belongs to them, they would raise the price of it. And when someone else is selling them something, they would come and say, no, 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 this is nothing, this is trash, this is not good. And they would cheat people. And those, these people, they're forced, they have to make a transaction, they need to buy food, they need to get some things that they need. So they would be forced to fall into that transaction that ends up harming them. So Allah says, وَلَا تَبْخَسُ النَّاسَ أَشْيَاءَهُمْ When someone has something, don't come and belittle what other people have. Don't belittle the task and the job of other people. And this is a habit that we humans have. If something I did, if I made something, right away I raise it and I say this is good and I praise it and I'm very happy and very proud of it. But if someone else did something, the exact same thing, a little bit better, a little bit worse, we come and we belittle the actions of other people. And this is haram. Allah says in the Quran, وَلَا تَبْخَسُ النَّاسَ أَشْيَاءَهُمْ Be sincere, be honest when it comes to transactions. This is what Islam means. It's not just praying and fasting. It comes to transactions, economic transactions, financial transaction. وَلَا تَعْثَوْ فِي الْأَرْضِ مُفْسِدِينَ Do not spread the facade, the facade, the harm on earth where you constantly cheat people. If we live in a society that everyone is constantly cheating other people, then what's going to happen? No one's going to be able to live safe. No one's going to be able to live comfortably. No one's going to be able to trust another, another person. وَلَا تَعْثَوْ فِي الْأَرْضِ مُفْسِدِينَ And then he tells them, بَقِيَّةُ اللَّهِ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ وَمَا أَنَا عَلَيْكُمْ Meaning that if you have a halal transaction based on the rules of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whatever extra you make when you, when you make a transaction, whatever extra that comes, if it's halal, halalullah, malullah, baqiyatullah, whatever is remaining, that if you take it the halal way, khayrun lakum in kuntum mu'mineen. That is better for you. If you are believers, if you believe in Allah, you will know that maybe if I don't cheat people, I will probably make $10 off a transaction. But if I cheat people, I will make $100 off of that transaction. Now, the way we think, our materialistic mindset tells me, of course, $100 is better than $10. But Allah says in the Quran that 
the halal transaction. That $10, even though it's less than the 100, that is better for you. In kuntum mu'mineen, if you are believers. If you believe in Allah, you will know that that which is less, probably, in the eyes of Allah, it's more. And that, it will have much more blessings. The hadith says that someone, two people, one person makes halal money, another person acquires haram rizq, haram income. The hadith says Allah will ibtalah Allah. Allah will punish this person and test this person through many other expenses that will rise. You see, sometimes people, they have money, but then they also have expenses. They also have expenses that come out of nowhere. The hadith says, ibtalahu Allah bil ma'i wa Meaning that this person, he will be tested with water and mud. And this is referring to the built, fixing the houses. You know when, when the house it begin, it starts falling apart, you have to come and throw a thousand dollars here, five hundred dollars here to fix some, something that's wrong with the house? This is what happens. This is what happens. Maybe this person made more money because they cheated other people. Because of a fraud. Because of cheating. But then the money will come out through a way that this person will not enjoy. It will come out and it will all have to be spent in another way. And this, my dear brothers and sisters, is very applicable to our life today. This issue, making halal income, halal sustenance, this is very applicable to our life today. Today we see people, their life and their death and everything, it's money. How much money people make. You see sometimes people, they break off their relationship with Allah, sometimes with family members, sometimes with friends, because of a few extra dollars here and there. And the reason why there's conflict is because one person is cheating another person. If people are not cheating, if people are honest and sincere when it comes to their transactions, there should be no conflict. But there's conflict because one side wants to take extra from another side. One side does not want to pay the other their dues. Their ta their, uh, pay other what they deserve. And this, it causes problems. It not only brings the wrath of Allah upon a person, but it causes problems within the society, within the community. Sometimes you see brothers. A few days ago, one brother he says, I would send my money to my brother so that he buys something in my name. Then he goes back to the country. After many years, he goes back to the country. He finds out his brother put everything in his own name. He put everything in his own name and he tells him, I'm not going to give you back. He sent thousands and thousands of dollars to this person. Sometimes you see between family members, between brothers, between close friends, and this is, it does not bring barakah to the life. Allah says, Allah, You make income that is halal, that is much better for you than going and acquiring haram income. Maybe the halal income, it requires doing a task that everyone looks down upon. Maybe it requires to be a cleaner in a room. To, be, to do, do, do something that people look down upon. But if that's halal in the eyes of Allah, that is much better than making thousands and thousands of dollars, but it's haram. Because that money that, it's, that is made haram, it's going, I'm going to be held accountable for it on the Day of Judgment. And we see that the issue of financial transaction is very applicable in our life today. Today we see some people, they say, I'm Muslim. They come to the masjid, they probably pray Salat al-Layl, they fast, they go to Hajj, but then when it comes to insurance, they have insurance fraud, tax fraud. They cheat other people. They fool other people when it comes to transactions. Now some people come and say, yes, I'm not cheating Muslims. I'm cheating non-Muslims. Where does it say in the Quran, in the hadith of the Prophet, anywhere that it's halal to cheat non-Muslims? Nowhere does it say that. But you find some people, they, begin, they start making their own religion and their own uh, reasoning behind making money. And you see that people always do that. When it comes to money, they're willing to go around and have so many loopholes and, and cheat people and make up so many arguments just so they can make 
a little bit of extra money here and there, even though that money is haram. And this is one means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests people. Maybe Allah doesn't test me by my salah because I pray. Maybe Allah doesn't test me by my, zak by my, by my fasting, by my hajj, because I do all of these. But Allah tests me through my money. How many of us are willing, how many of us are going to pass that test? And the problem is, when someone makes haram money, when someone acquires haram rizq, haram income, what does that mean? That means that their food is also haram. How does food become haram? Food becomes haram in two ways. One way is if I go to the store, I go to McDonald's and I buy a Big Mac and I start eating it. This is haram. This is one way of eating haram food. But there's another way of eating haram food and that is, no, I go to the halal store. I go and I buy from the halal store. But my money was haram. My money, I made that money by cheating people, by fooling people, by deceiving other people. The money becomes haram. Go and buy halal food with it. That money is haram. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi says, Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. He says, Man akala luqmata haramin lam tuqbal lahu salat arba'een layla. He who eats one bite of haram, this person, their salah, is not accepted for 40 nights. وَلَمْ تَسْتَجِبْ لَهُ دَعْوَهُ أَرْبَعِينَ صَبَاحًا And his dua is not accepted for 40 days. And we ask, why do we do dua and Allah doesn't answer our duas? The problem is not with Allah. Sometimes the problem is with us. And then he says, وَكُلُّ لَحْمٍ يَنْبَتُهُ الْحَرَامِ فَالنَّارُ أَوْلَى بِهِ And every flesh, when I eat haram, new flesh will grow based on that haram. Rasulullah says, every flesh that grows out of haram, فَالنَّارُ أَوْلَى لَهِ That will be burned by the fire. وَإِنَّ اللُّقْمَ الْوَاحِدَةِ تَنْبِتُ اللَّحْمِ And even one bite. Now someone could say, it's just one bite. It's just one hamburger. It's just one meal. It's just one haram dollar. Rasulullah says, وَإِنَّ اللُّقْمَ الْوَاحِدَةِ تَنْبِتُ اللَّحْمِ Even one bite, flesh grows from that. And Allah says in the... And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created paradise in a way that haram does not enter paradise. This is why you see people, sometimes they go through trials and tribulations in their lives until they enter, and once they die, and then once they enter paradise. So that no haram flesh enters paradise. This is why you see some people before their death, they're tested in a way, in a difficult way, through a disease, through a difficult test. One interpretation to this, of course, for the mu'min, this is a means that Allah is going to reward this person. But one answer for this is that Allah is cleansing this person in this life so that once this person passes away, they will enter paradise without any test, without any cleansing in the afterlife. So we see that this is a test for people when it comes to financial transactions, when it comes to money. And the best of people are tested in this way. Sometimes even a mu'min, sometimes even a believer, sometimes a person who goes to hajj every year, you find that when it comes to their income, they have a haram income. And this is a means that Allah tests people. Sometimes the closest people to the imams they were tested in this way. Why did people turn against Imam al Hussein alayhi salam? Most of them, Umar ibn Sa'd, he was the cousin. He was a far cousin of Imam al Hussein. But he wanted to have mulk al ray He wanted to have power. Some, they wanted the dananir, the dirhams and the dananir. Because Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, he promised them. They went and they were willing to kill the grandson of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa One man, he was a companion of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam by the name of Ali ibn Abi Hamza al-Bata'ini. Many of our ahadith are narrated from him. This man, Ali ibn Abi Hamza al-Bata'ini, he was a companion of Imam al-Sadiq. He was a companion of Imam Musa ibn Ja'far al-Kadhim. But once Imam... And then he became, he became the wakil of Imam al-Kadhim. Meaning that he was the person that people, they would come and they would give their money to him so that he delivers them to the Imam. Imam al-Kadhim alayhi salam, 
he was thrown into a prison. Then once Imam al-Kadhim passed away, this person Ali ibn Abi Hamza al-Bata'ini, he had thousands of dirhams and dinanir. They came and they told him, Imam al-Rada is the next Imam. Go and give the money back to Imam al-Rada. He decided to keep them to himself. Now this person was the wakil of the Imam. That means the Imam had, he, he would collect on behalf of the Imam. But then he was tested. He was tested and Imam al-Rada curses him. And he became the leader of the Waqifi school of thought. The Waqifi sect, they stopped on Imam al-Kadhim. After Imam al-Kadhim, they stopped believing in Imam al-Rada alayhi salam. He was the leader of that group. And he did not accept the Imam of Imam al-Rada. Because of money, he lost this life and the afterlife. Now, what's surprising is that this man, Ali ibn Abi Hamza al-Bata'ini, during the time where, he, during the life of Imam Sadiq, where apparently he was a good person, he was a follower of the Ahlul Bayt, he comes one day to Medina and he brings a man to Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. He brings this man to Imam Sadiq and this man tells Imam Sadiq, Oh Imam, I used to work with Bani Umayyah. I used to work with Bani Umayyah and I used to count their money. I used to make money because of, I work with them. Now I want to repent. I want to ask Allah to forgive me. Will Allah forgive me? My whole life I worked with Bani Umayyah, the ones who persecuted and killed the Imams. The Imam alayhi salam, he tells him, it's because of people like you that our haq was taken away from us. Because people who say, I want to live, I want to make money. Not caring whether it's halal money or haram money. The Imam says, it's because of people like you, our rights were taken away from us. Because you were, a'wan, you were, you were helping. وَلَا تَرْكَنُوا إِلَى الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا فَتَمَسَّكُمُ النَّارِ You came and you were helping the zalim against us. So the man says, but I, I have repented. I want to repent. Is there a way that Allah will forgive me? The Imam tells him, yes. There is a way, but it's a very difficult way. If you promise me you will do what I tell you to do, I will guarantee you paradise. The man said, and he's standing with Ali ibn Abi Hamza al-Bata'ini. He says, I promise. The Imam tells him, you have to give away, give back all of the haram money that you made. Every, every cent, you have to give it back. Every dinar, every dirham, you have to give it back. So this man was in Mecca, he was in Hajj, either in Medina or, in, or Mecca. He goes back to Kufa. He goes back to Kufa with, with Ali ibn Abi Hamza al-Bata'ini. Ali ibn Abi Hamza narrates the story. He says, this man went and he began, began to give away all of his money. Everything he began to give it back to the people, the rightful owners. And the ones who he doesn't know who the rightful owner is, he comes and he gives it as a charity on, on their behalf. Until he had nothing left. Ali ibn Abi Hamza says, a year later, or a while later, I went to him. I knocked on the door, he opened the door, he didn't have clothes to cover his, himself. He didn't have clothes to cover himself. He says, I went and I got him something to cover his body with. He says, this man, he became sick until he passed away. He says, Ali ibn Abi Hamza says, I went to Imam Sadiq the next year when I was visiting the Imam. He says, as soon as the Imam, his eye fell on me, before I even entered, he tells me, Ya, ya, Abi, ya, ya Ali ibn Abi Hamza, laqad shafa'na li sahibak. Oh, Ali ibn Abi Hamza, I did shafa'a for your friend, the one that you brought him. I guaranteed him paradise, and he entered paradise. The Imam is in, in Medina, and this man dies in Kufa, but the Imam knows. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps the Imam connected with the mu'mineen. Now, the irony is Ali ibn Abi Hamza, he's the one who brought this Umawi, the man who used to be an Umawi, he repented and he cleansed himself and he goes to paradise and Ali ibn Abi Hamza goes to hell because he neglected Imam al-Rida alayhi salam and he stole from the Imam of his time. So, Prophet Shu'aib alayhi salam explains to the people, he tells them it's haram, but his people, they reject him. Allah describes, كَذَّبَتْ أَصْحَابُ الْأَيْكَةِ الْمُرْسَلِينَ إِذْ قَالَ لَهُمْ شُعَيْبٌ أَلَا تَتَّقُونَ إِنِّي لَكُمْ رَسُولٌ أَمِينٌ فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ وَأَطِيعُونَ They rejected all of the prophets, 
the message of all of the prophets. And we mentioned this yesterday. Rejecting one prophet, it means rejecting all of the prophets. And they neglected him. And then he tells them, وَمَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ مِنْ أَجْرًا إِنَّ أَجْرِي إِلَّا عَلَى رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ I'm not asking for anything from you. Again he tells them, وَأَوْفُ الْكَيْلَ وَلَا تَكُونُوا مِنَ الْمُخْسِرِينَ Don't cheat people when you have a transaction. وَزِنُوا الْقِسْطَاصَ الْمُسْتَقِيمُ وَلَا تَبْخَسُوا النَّاسَ أَشْيَاءَهُمْ وَلَا تَعْثَوْا فِي الْأَرْضِ مُفْسِدِينَ Tells them, don't cheat people, don't fool people. What did they reply to him? قَالُوا يَا شُعَيْبُ أَصَلَاتُكَ تَأْمُرُكَ أَن نَتْرُكَ مَا يَعْبُدُ آبَاؤُنَا Is it your prayer that's stopping us? And this is the sarcasm that you find from the people who don't pray, who don't worship, who don't believe in Allah to the ones that do believe. Oh, this person started praying, now he comes and he wants to tell me this is halal, this is haram, this is right, this is wrong. أَصَلَاتُكَ تَأْمُرُكَ is it your prayer that is ordering us to let go of what our fathers used to worship for many decades, for, many, for a long time? This is our tradition. And is it your prayer that is telling us to let go of our habits and our financial transactions? Go and pray. Do whatever you want to do. Don't come and tell us how to live our lives, how to make our money, and how to deal with other people. قَالَ يَا قَوْمْ أَرَأَيْتُمْ إِن كُنْتُ عَلَى بَيِّنَةٍ مِّن رَبِّي وَرَزَقَنِي مِنْهُ رِزْقًا حَسَنًا وَمَا أُرِيدُ أَنْ أُخَالِفُكُمْ إِلَّا مَا أَنْهَاكُمْ عَنْ He tells them, don't you see, Allah is giving me halal sustenance. You don't have to cheat people to make halal money. And this is the bayina, this is the proof that Allah has given me. I'm bringing proof, I'm not coming and making something up. And I'm not trying to make money out of you or make, have you lose your money by telling you to have halal transactions but they rejected him he tells them وَمَا تَوْفِيقِي إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ تَوَكَّلْتِ وَإِلَيْهِ أُنِيبُ I'm relying on Allah and the rizq comes from Allah if you have tawakkul on Allah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send the sustenance to you they kept rejecting they kept rejecting he warns them again وَيَا قَوْمِ لَا يَجْرِمَنَّكُمْ شِقَاقِي أَنْ يُصِيبَكُمْ مِثْلَ مَا أَصَابَ قَوْمِ نُوحٍ أَوْ قَوْمَ هُودٍ أَوْ قَوْمَ صَالِحٍ وَمَا قَوْمَ لُوطٍ مِنْكُمْ بِبَعِيدٍ Be afraid. Because what, will ha what, ha what happened to the people of Nuh and happened to the people of Hud and the people of Salih can also happen to you. And the people of Lut, وَمَا قَوْمُ لُوطٍ مِنْكُمْ بِبَعِيدٍ Meaning that even in distance, in geographical location, the people of of, of Lut were, are very close to you, to Madain, and the time, the time is all very near. Imagine there was an earthquake that happened 10 years ago. Many people died in that earthquake. I come and I tell people, this happened very near. It happened in a city close by. This is very close. That means it could happen. The probability, the chances of happening again are very strong. But they kept rejecting. And instead, not only did they reject him, they come and they tell him, if you are right, tell Allah to bring our punishment. Let Allah punish us. Let Allah bring the adab upon us. If you are right. قَالُوا يَا شُعَيْبْ مَا نَفْقَهُ كَثِيرًا مِمَّا تَقُولُ Oh Shu'ayb, we don't understand what you say. Even though Rasulullah says, Shu'ayb was the orator of the prophets. That means he was a good speaker. He was able to deliver the message very well. But they come and they tell him sarcastically, مَا نَفْقَهُ مَا تَقُولُ قَالُوا يَا شُعَيْبْ مَا نَفْقَهُ كَثِيرًا مِمَّا تَقُولُ وَإِنَّا لَنَرَاكَ فِينَا ضَعِيفًا And you're a weak person. What are you going to do? The hadith says that he was blind. Shu'ayb was blind. So they come and they belittle him because he is blind. And then they tell him, وَلَوْلَا رَهْطُكَ لَرَجَمْنَاكَ وَمَا أَنْتَ عَلَيْنَا بِعَزِيزٍ And if it was not for your tribe, if it was not for your family, we would stone you to death. We don't honor you. We don't respect you. What does he reply to them? He replies to them. He tells them, قَالَ يَا قَوْمْ أَرَهْطِي أَعَزُّ عَلَيْكُمْ مِنَ اللَّهِ O oh people, you are afraid of my tribe. You don't kill me because of my tribe. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, don't do wrong. You are afraid of tribes and people, and you are not afraid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
عليكم من الله واتخذ واتخذتموه وراءكم ظهيرا إن ربي بما تعلمون محيط. He tells them the عذاب of Allah will fall upon you if you continue rejecting, if you continue ignoring the order. And they kept insisting, they kept insisting, they kept worshiping the idols, they kept cheating other people. And they came and they told him, let your Lord punish us. If you are right, let your Lord punish us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought the adab upon them. وَلَمَّا جَاءَ أَمْرُنَا نَجَّيْنَا شُعَيْبًا We saved Shu'ayb when the time came. وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مَعَهُ بِرَحْمَةٍ مِنَّا وَأَخَذَتَ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا الصَّيْحَةِ وَأَخَذَتَ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا الصَّيْحَةِ فَأَصْبَحُوا فِي دِيَارِهِمْ جَاثِمِينَ And there was a loud sound, a thunder or a type of sound that killed them all. Now, this is the story that Allah mentions in the Qur'an. And then there's another story, another aspect to the life of Prophet Shu'aib, and that was with Prophet Musa alayhi salam. Prophet Shu'aib, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi mentions that Prophet Shu'aib used to cry all the time. Allah tells him, why are you crying? He kept crying until he lost his eyesight. Allah tells him, why are you crying? Are you crying because you are afraid of the hellfire? Or are you crying because you want paradise? Shu'aib replies, I'm not crying because I'm afraid of the hellfire. And I'm not crying because I want paradise. I'm crying because I love you, O oh Allah. Out of my love for you, it makes me cry. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replies, إِذَنْ سَيَخْدُمُكَ كَلِيمِي Therefore, my kaleem will be your servant. The kaleem of Allah. Who is the kaleem of Allah? The kaleem of Allah is Prophet Musa. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. He says, my kaleem will be your servant. The kaleem of Allah is Prophet Musa. What happened? The story happened. When Musa alayhi salam, and when we explain the story of Prophet Musa, we will, we will explain this. Musa was in Egypt, he was born in Egypt, but then after killing that man, accidentally killing that man, Prophet Musa alayhi salam, he had to escape. Where did he go to? He goes to Madian. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the story in the Quran, وَلَمَّا تَوَجَّهَتِ الْقَاءَ مَدْيًا قَالَ عَسَى رَبِّي أَنْ يَهْدِيَنِي سواء السبيل ولما ورد ماء مدين وجد عليه أمة من الناس يسقون. so he came to Madian and he came to a place where there was people taking water out of the well. he saw people it's so chaotic and he saw two young ladies, two young ladies waiting to feed to get water and give their sheep their cattle the water. and the men are not allowing them. So Prophet Musa alayhi salam, he goes and he takes water for them. He goes and he takes water for them. He helps them, he moves the men, he takes the water, and then he gives it to these two ladies. He doesn't know who they are. And Prophet Musa alayhi salam, at that time, after giving them the water, فَسَقَى لَهُمَا ثُمَّ تَوَلَّى إِلَى الظِّلْ فَقَالَ رَبِّ إِنِّي لِمَا أَنزَلْتَ إِلَيَّ مِنْ خَيْرٍ فَقِيرٍ He gave them the water and he went and sat under the shade. He sat under a tree and he says, Oh Allah, رَبِّ إِنِّي لِمَا أَنزَلْتَ إِلَيَّ مِنْ خَيْرٍ فَقِيرٍ I'm faqeer. Rasulullah says that he didn't have a date to eat. This is how faqeer he was. He didn't have anything to eat to provide for himself because he, was escaped, he escaped from Egypt. فَجَاءَتْهُ إِحْدَاهُمَا تَمْشِي عَلَى اسْتِحْيَاءَ One of the girls, one of the ladies comes to him, walking with modesty. قَالَتْ إِنَّ أَبِي يَدْعُوكَ لِيَجْزِيكَ أَجْرَ مَا سَقَيْتَ لَنَا She comes and she tells him, my father calls you. And our fa my father is an old man. Come. So Prophet Musa alayhi salam, he goes. He goes. Here... This is the part where historians, some are divided and some are certain, although the majority agree that this is Shu'aib, although the name of Shu'aib is not mentioned in this. Shu'aib, 
Prophet Musa comes to Shu'ayb and Shu'ayb tells him, marry one of my daughters and come and work for me. Live with me and I will protect you. I will give you refuge. Be with me for eight hijaj, eight hajjas. And this is, this is uh, the Imam says that this is the proof that even at that time, the time of Prophet Shu'ayb, people used to go and perform the hajj. He tells him, Thaman hajjaj, eight hajjaj, and if you would like to add two, then you can do that. And this is what happened. Because Shu'ayb used to cry for Allah, Allah tells him, my kaleem will be your servant. So Musa, Allah destined for Musa to leave Egypt, and he, come, he comes all the way to Madian, and he becomes the servant of Prophet Shu'ayb. The kaleem of Allah, he comes and he serves in the house of Shu'ayb. For 10 years, he's with Shu'ayb, and then he also marries one of, his, one of the daughters. And then after 10 years, Prophet Musa, he goes back to Egypt and the story of his prophethood starts where he becomes a prophet of Allah. This is the story of Prophet Shu'ayb in the Quran. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have us learn from the Quran, have tafaqqah in the Quran, where we don't just read these stories and it goes in one ear and comes out of the other ear without learning, without actually implementing the teachings of these prophets. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa sallallahu ala Muhammadin wa ala alihi.